welcome my dear friends for this very exciting session where dr anand deshpande will your master's thesis before listening to dr anand deshpande i would request professor anil sarasrabuddhe to uh, give his welcome remarks yeah good morning uh, all of you namaskar we have uh, with us dr anand deshpande dr abhay jere my colleagues in aict dr punia dr rajiv uh, today we have a very interesting talk by dr anand deshpande on the topic from your phd masters thesis to a startup it's very exciting and before i speak something more i would like to introduce dr anand deshpande although before uh, uh, you know a little while ago he was saying that to introduce me very briefly but i think for the audience it is important to know the background of dr anand he is the founder chairman and managing director of uh, persistent systems since its inception and is responsible for overall leadership management of the company anand holds a btech degree in computer science from iit kharagpur and then masters and phd in computer science from indiana university indiana usa uh, very importantly he is a great visionary because the very fact that the way persistent systems was formed and then led by him it shows uh, the spirit of entrepreneurship that resides within him he has been a recipient of several awards including the best alumnus or distinguished alumnus award of the iit kharagpur itself and then many other social and uh, other organizations uh, but what is important and striking is he has been associated with different professional bodies with be it nascom acm computer society of india cii and all of them and also a member of the executive committee of mccia but i found that he is also on the dean's advisory council of the school of informatics and computer engineering of indiana university where he studied his masters and phd so is great alumnus back home to support the same institution where he started off his uh, phd anand is founding member of isprit and india's uh, product think tank the first of its kind and importantly another very interesting initiative he and his family are driving is called de asara in hindi or in marathi or in many indian languages uh, de asara is give lend a support and you know, help a spirit of uh, lending support that means whether it is in terms of uh, uh, what we call mentorship or financially all of that he has been doing and driving it and one of those uh, organizations with uh, which he started that is uh, i4c uh, which is inter institutional inclusive innovation center uh, and uh, mhrd is then and now ministry of educations what we call as uh, innovation cell at aict we are working together for holding several hackathons and most of the students are aware of uh, the history of hackathons uh, in india started by dr abhay jere who himself is on second wind from persistent systems here and now the talk is very interesting that uh, how from your masters and phd thesis one can create a startup but i was just trying to see how many students actually graduate what do they do in our indian context and i found from our aict's uh, statistics which we get it from all the institutions annually that about 1 million students graduate every year 10 lakh is very large number you know it's a second largest technical education system in the world and uh, as far as startups are concerned we are the third largest startup ecosystem of the world uh, but when we see this uh, number uh, you know 10 lakh students 1 uh, million how many of them are coming into the higher education we saw that uh, in masters there are about 60000 plus you know it varies year to year depending on job market because i found that 90 to 95% of the students who graduate are all interested in jobs you know high paying jobs and nothing else uh, but uh, some of the students who come into masters if you analyze some of them come because they did not get a job some of them come because there is a fellowship which is given which is almost like a mini salary some of them come for doing their ias some of them come because of passion for teaching and minimum qualification for becoming a teacher is a masters or a phd degree and only few have that huge passion for research and converting that research problem into an entrepreneurial journey i think that is where we stand so i think it is not even a minuscule 1% of these graduates who are actually passionate but then 
we found that there are about 6% students anyway coming to the masters and some of them will come into the phd program how we can motivate them how we can inspire them how we can show them the path that their problem of research can easily be converted into a, a start, possibly an entrepreneurial journey a startup you know that is what uh, dr anand is going to speak today and uh, I, I over to anand and then uh, let us have an interactive session together thank you very much thanks a lot let me give me a moment i'm going to get my screen up and uh... so meanwhile i will just inform the panelists and viewers that we have more than 9300 people live right now all right so is this all set up correctly can you see the screen and uh, everything else that is happening yeah yeah Are we set uh, right. it's visible yes we all can right. see Perfect. Uh, so thanks a lot. And it's a real pleasure to talk to all of you. And, uh, you know, it's a really hard topic that I'm going to talk about. And I wanted to give you a little bit of motivation of why this problem came up in the first place. Okay. So I've been very active in ACM India. And uh, one of the discussions we have in ACM has been that there's an annual research conference. And at that research conference, they had a panel discussion. And in that panel discussion, there was a, a topic which, what about jobs for people who come out of PhDs? And they had two research uh, labs, uh, Microsoft, Google, and then they had two IITs as faculty members. So I was trying to challenge this group and saying that, hey, because someone has done a PhD, does it really have to be that they have to join a research lab? And do they have to join a research institution? But actually, the PhD is a good training for being an entrepreneur. And why aren't we encouraging people who have completed their PhD to think about entrepreneurship? So then when you suggest something, typically someone will come and say, OK, if you say so, tell us what it means. Okay, So that's how this thing got set up. All right. And uh, so I'm going to share with you a little bit about how this today's talk is going to be all about. And I want this to be a conversation to the extent possible. So it is pretty hard to do this on a YouTube uh, kind of a format. But I encourage you to ask your questions online. There are several people who are listening to it. I'm going to take pauses in between and uh, answer questions or have a discussion in between. And uh, what I wanted to do was to see how this could be a useful session for many of you. Most of what I'm going to present has lots of references here and references to books and other literature. We will make the presentation available to you. So in case you feel like uh, reading over it later on, uh, that should be possible. So I'm going to use this format for today. So first, I want to congratulate all of you. As uh, Professor Sastrabuddha already mentioned, uh, only 6% of those who graduate from undergrad actually end up going to the master's program. So you are already a privileged bunch. You have done really well to get to where you are. And a small number of these are going to be PhD students and completing PhD. So even more uh, uh, sort of specialized, smaller group, tighter knit group. So I highly um, want to congratulate you and thank you for all of this stuff. I think uh, we all sort of grow up in this uh, mindset constraint that says that if you have done a PhD, you must continue to do research for life. And researchers cannot be entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurship and research don't go together at all in some form or the other. So what I want to share with you today is to break this myth of saying that, you know, just because you did a PhD doesn't mean you must do research for life. And also, even if you want to do research, research and entrepreneurship can go hand in hand and they're not that different from each other. And it's a rewarding experience and an exciting experience to be an entrepreneur researcher and a researcher who is an entrepreneur. So I'm going to share a little bit about this. And this whole picture that I have here about this elephant is that what happens is that when an elephant is very young, he's tied to a small pole like this and he somehow feels like, you know, he cannot get away. He tries in the beginning and then he finds he cannot run away. Even though the elephant grows, the pole remains the same because the elephant somehow is conditioned to believe that he cannot run away. So this is what has happened to many of our PhD students who somehow believe that research or teaching is the only option for them. And that's what I want to discuss with you and show you that by doing your PhD, you have possessed or you have learned the most important skills of entrepreneurship. And there I want to say that, you know, you have already demonstrated that you are innovative, you are a beacon of innovation, you have found something new and unique that you have worked on for a 
long period of time, three, five years, you have worked on the same problem. So you have demonstrated that you have the ability to stay focused and you don't get distracted by random things. This is again very important for an entrepreneur. Persistence is very clear, critical. And you are doing this in a contextually aware situation. So you are aware of the, the, the situation in which you are doing your PhD problem. You cannot just solve a problem without understanding the context in which you are delivering your thesis. So you have demonstrated all of these abilities, which are absolutely essential for someone who wants to, to complete your PhD thesis. And I congratulate you for demonstrating this. Now, if you look at entrepreneurship, these are exactly the same skills that you need. And hence, I'm trying to suggest to you that you should go about it. And as the um, uh, professor mentioned, you know, I've been very passionate about the Asra Foundation, which is a family foundation. And we are really focused on creating job creators. And I believe that all of you who are privileged should not suck out jobs for those which should be left for mere mortals. You are PhD guys, you are the master's people, you have done all of these kinds of great things. You should be the ones creating jobs for other people and not be demanding jobs. And I really believe that all of you should become job creators rather than job suckers in some sense. So, you know, this is a little bit of a guilt trip for you all to keep this going. But anyway, so now let me get to this. Okay, fine, you agree with me that you have learned good stuff. You have had a journey of incredibly great opportunity to show your tenacity, focus, contextual awareness, persistence, and you have already figured that out. But now you say, okay, how do I go about being an entrepreneur? What do I need to do? And how does this all work? So in the next few minutes or rather 25, 40 minutes or so, I'm gonna to explain to you the three main things that you need to think about when you are trying to do entrepreneurship or starting your own business. One is to build an idea and validate that. The second important aspect I'm going to share is about team building. And the third important aspect is how do you manage your cash? And I'm going to give you a good reference as to how to follow up on this. So clearly you did your PhD problem. A lot of people think that just because I did this PhD problem, I should be good for the business. Now your objective for your PhD problem was to ensure that your advisor is happy with the PhD problem and not necessarily thinking about the business. Yeah, let me take a short pause here and see if uh, are there any questions or anything else that are, that you think you want to discuss. Sir, am I making sense here? Do you agree that the uh, you know PhDs are very much like an entrepreneurial role? Absolutely, I fully endorse and agree with that. And even stepping a little earlier, the very fact that uh, identification of the problem, which you are already raising now. Uh, the guide to be happy, you know, in fact, uh, we all go to the library, internet and try to hunt for the gaps that exist in the, in the domain and then try to find out that. So same way for starting an entrepreneurial journey somewhere where there are gaps, you know, where there are no solutions. If you get into that, probably you will be more successful. Uh, and so I think okay. there are absolute parallel between what we do in PhD program and uh, in, in the entrepreneurial journey. Right. So, sir, I'm going to share now a little bit of ideas on how the business processes how so in, in the startup world i guess there are a lot of literature on this topic which i think may be interesting and we should relate it to the phd problem also so i'm going to share with you the process of how people go about identifying the problem and the most common or the the one that i really like is this whole concept of lean startups so uh, i'm going to share a little bit about how lean startups work and uh, you know and you will see how that could be related to someone who's doing a PhD while you are doing a PhD. And how can you take that to get to this thing? Now the PhD problem seems like a const constant mess of things. You know, you want to get from your idea to the PhD problem and your degree. And it seems like, uh, you know, you don't seem to see that you're going to see the end of it. However, uh, there is a process you follow. And let me explain to you how this process works. So let's to get started. I'm going to suggest that, you know, this is a, a body of work that has gone on for more than 50, 60 years around lean manufacturing. And the main objective of lean manufacturing is to reduce waste. And this is something that uh, Toyota production system really, really focused on. And they spent a lot of time trying to explain how you can get the production system to work very well by reducing waste. And lean is really a journey of how you go about it to try to reduce waste. And the the key exponents of lean are Edward Deming, um, who also did this in the US and in General Motors and others, and Taichi Ono from Toyota Manufacturing. And they really came up with this whole idea of reducing waste. 
Now, if you look at a startup and you look at the lean journey, um, what happens is that when you build a product or you're building a solution, uh, you're starting from an idea and then evolving it over a period of time, and then you get and build a solution. And at that point, if you find out that, okay, this solution, I want to take it to the market, and you realize that it flops, then uh, the whole time that you spent in building out the solution feels like it's completely wasted. So the whole idea about Lean is that, can I do this in a way that I can reduce the waste of iterations that I have to do from the process of my idea all the way to the product. And when I'm doing this iterative process, uh, can I do this faster? And one of the most important ways of how this can be done faster uh, uh, has been thought of by this gentleman called Steve Blank. He used to be a founder of a various set of companies, including a company called Epiphany. And he then eventually became a professor at UC Berkeley. And you see, he has created a program which is called a Launchpad class. And I think uh, Sir may be aware of this. So Deshpande Foundation, uh, along with actually Desh Deshpande and IIT Madras with Chris Chopalakrishnan, they have been working on taking this NSF's iCorps program to India as well. And many of the PhD and faculty members are being encouraged to look at that. So this has come from uh, Steve's work. Do you want to say anything about it, uh, Sir, uh, on the program that you have? With IIT Madras, I'm sure you're part of that as well. No, I think it's very important that uh, the learning from UC Berkeley in terms of ICOPS and uh, Steve Blanks, uh, as well as Desh Deshpande. He, he drives also another initiative of uh, uh, social entrepreneurship in Hubli. Yes. You know, uh, and many other initiatives of Desh are, are very, very valid uh, for Indian context whether it is faculty development, whether it is research, innovation, as well as uh, startups. Correct. So uh, he started this whole movement around lean startup movement. And one of the most uh, well-known exponents of this is a student, student uh, gentleman called Eric Ries. And he has written these two books called The Lean Startup and The Startup Way. These are absolutely phenomenal uh, books in terms of how the whole process works. And there's a lot of literature on the lean startup, uh, which are there. He runs courses, which are several weeks. So I'm going to give you a 10-minute glimpse of what lean startup and the whole crux of this whole thing is all about and how to go about it. So as I mentioned to you, one of the biggest challenges that we have when you do a startup or you build a company is you come up with an idea, you think that this is what the market needs, you build it out, maybe it takes you six months, takes you a year, two years, whatever. And at the end of it, you don't want it to be failing, right? So one of the ideas of this whole lean startup is can you do iterative processes so that you are incorporating various aspects of this in the process, including the customer who is a big part of it. So this whole concept of build, measure, learn. So that is really what he came back with. And his thing was that, okay, build experiments, baseline them, measure the metrics, analyze them, learn from it, and then you have to make a choice. Do you pivot or preserve? Preserve means, okay, I like what I've done so far. I continue with that journey or you pivot saying, oh, well, this didn't work out. I want to make a change from that. Go back to my, revise my hypothesis, go back to build experiments, baseline. And you keep leap, looping through this circuit over and over again. Does this not sound very similar to a PhD discussion? Exactly what you are doing, building experiments, baselining them, measuring metrics, analyzing them, deciding to pivot or preserve and getting back to the experiments. So this is really the crux of the build, measure, learn loop. Um, Abhay, do you agree with this, sir? Do you have any comment? I really agree with you uh, on this. And uh, I think uh, uh, when we are doing some of our innovation ambassador training programs and when we are talking to some of the startup student startups, which we are uh, funding, we are talking about this. Uh, and we, along with that, we are also pushing the model fail early, fail, fail fast kind of a thing so that you can go back to your drawing board and reanalyze your strategy so that you don't end up wasting time while you are coming working on your next set of ideas. Right. So, uh, um, so Dr. Adan, I, in fact, this is absolutely a basic uh, ethos of any individual, uh, general knowledge, what, what I call. Where you look at a, a shop, for example, grocery shop or a medical pharmacy shop or even supermarket for that matter. What exactly is required to be stored, how much to be stored and when it has to be you know, replenished. All of that they are doing by experience and no one would like to stock unnecessarily and then waste the material. 
So I think this is all in the psyche of people. It's only that someone will use it and someone are not using it. We have to make them realize that actually. Correct, correct. So clearly, you know, build, measure, learn is really the objective of what uh, the uh, Eric Ries and uh, Steve Blank said. One other very important thing that Steve Blank said is that when you are doing all of this work of build, measure, learn, and all of these other ideas, and you are trying to decide the pivot, a lot of times researchers and people get into this sort of um, glass ceiling, glass buildings, or whatever else where they are sitting in the top floor of their building and trying to make decisions. The reality of what Steve Blank says is there are no facts inside the building. So get the heck outside and talk to customers. And this is really the key of how businesses are built. When you are doing an experiment, you don't want to just do it amongst yourselves, but involve your customers at that point, right? And that's sort of where the whole objective of any particular business is to say, am I building to a problem that is relevant? Is there a solution that I've built that is relevant? Is this solution at a viable price that can be sold at the right point for large numbers of people? And then can we repeat this solution and scale our business? So this is really what is all about in terms of how a business is built. So again, just to summarize again, so you have a problem idea. You, you don't know if this is gonna work. Well, involve the customers, create a hypothesis, build some experiments to validate that, then go measure if those experiments are working correctly. So you think that I have this particular product, which is a great video camera, it's gonna work out, it's the best thing that has happened. Okay, build it, build a little bit, show it to people and come back and then experiment with it. Show it to customers, see what they think. Do they like it, do they not like it? And then if you like, if they find that this is all working out and you are able to do it, preserve the experiment or pivot to something different. And one of the other topics that people talk a lot about is this whole concept of MVP or the minimum viable product. And I think a lot of people get too hung up on the minimum part of it. The key is to build something that is viable. And if you look at this process of experimentation, what is it that you are trying to ask these questions about? What is my riskiest assumption? And what is the smallest experiment that I can do to test that riskiest assumption? And I'm sure you all who are doing PSPs or uh, otherwise completely understand this, that you, know, you don't want to sort of find out that you have kept your riskiest assumption to be validated last, because by then you would be too late. So you might as well bring that in early Decide what your riskiest assumption is and what is the smallest experiment that I can do to validate that. It is not saying that do the smallest experiment. You are doing the smallest experiment to validate the riskiest assumption. So this is really what minimum viable product is and it's not about building something small and dirty and hoping that it works. It is about building the most viable product with the least smallest experiment that can be made. So this is really the principle of what uh, people talk about in this whole concept of uh, you know lean, manuf lean manufacturing, moving into lean startups. Of course, there is a lot of literature on this topic. And in you know, 15, 20 minutes, I'm trying to give you the gist of it. But the whole idea is it's a repetitive, iterative process. You go one step at a time, and there is a systematic way to validate whether you are making the right decision or not. And a lot of it depends on your ability to get to that point. So, so, so that's where it is. Uh, I'll take a short pause, see if there are any questions, and then I'll move to the next topic on which is related to this again. No, currently there are no, no major questions. But Anand, uh, when I am talking to many of the students uh, about minimum viable product, many times they just fail to understand what it means to be a viable product, minimum viable product. You know, sometimes. Uh, and as you rightly said, many of the students end up doing quick and dirty kind of a product, which they think is a minimal viable product. So if you can highlight some of the good literature which these students can read on what actually means minimum viable product, then that will be of great use. No, so you can, so, take, you can do it at the end of the uh, no, talk. Let me answer very quickly right here. And what I'm saying is that, see, I have these books that I have included in this one. Uh, actually, there are links on this one, but if you look for Lean Startup and some of the work done by Eric Ries and Steve Blank, you should be able to see enough uh, discussion on minimum viable product. But lots of blogs. Actually, there is, there is uh, it took me a large number, a lot of time to figure this out, but there are a lot of, there is no shortage of literature on this topic. 
but one of the problems that happens is that you know when you have a lot of literature, people pick up um, uh, you know these sort of slogans that people put out without necessarily understanding the details of those slogans. So that's really what I've tried to avoid by sort of saying that viability is equally important and the whole objective of building a minimum viable product is to build that smallest experiment that addresses my riskiest assumption. So that's really what it is all about. Let me keep moving and I'll, I want to share this amazing work done by uh, Alex Osterwilder. And Os Alex Osterwilder's work is really amazing. I love his books. They are beautiful, but I'm going to talk today about this particular book that he has written, which is his first seminal work, in my opinion, it's called the business model generation. So what, what they say is that, you know, you have to take your business and let's say you're building, um, you know, so let's say you want to open a restaurant. Uh, you need to understand what is the value proposition of the restaurant? Who are your customer segments? And this is the order in which you go about it. Okay. So. First thing you do is to identify your customer segments. Who, are, who is this thing for, right? So, okay, I'm building a restaurant that is targeted to young people, or is it targeted to older people? Is it targeted to rich people? Uh, more expensive, less expensive, so whatever it is. So don't look at the customer as just one group, but break it into smaller segments that are much easier to understand. Then for the segments that you are picking up, find the value proposition that is most appropriate for that customer figure out how are you going to reach them? How are you going to discuss with them? How do they find out about you? How do they come to you? And then on the other side, you look at key partners, key resources and key activities, and then you tie this in with revenue streams and cost structures. So this is a very nice one page model that people use a lot to try to validate if your business can be put together as a business. So yes, you do this value proposition exercise, you do these changes between things and you can come back with this. To just to make this a little bit um, sort of real, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a Airbnb example, which is something that I have picked from a reference that is there from his website. And um, I'm going to just use that to give you an example of how this works. So the first thing that people look at is who are my customers? So people who are traveling. Now of those who are traveling, who would go to Airbnb? So they said, well, there may be budget travelers, there may be people who are on holidays, people who are locals looking for some extra income, unconventional travelers. So there are a whole bunch of different kinds of people who are the customers exactly. of Airbnb. Now, if I have to make this happen, what is the value proposition that Airbnb provides? Well, simple booking process, wide range of ways to get people to put their home up for, you know, for the right things, competitive rates. So, you know, if I'm putting my house up for Airbnb uh, for people to use, I don't know how much to charge. Now, Airbnb will tell me that, okay, if you're charging in this locality, in this neighborhood, at this time of the year, at this rate, you should be okay because they have an understanding of what the, you know, the setup is. They also guide you in terms of what, how to go about it. And then, of course, you know, there are various mechanisms of how you connect with these people. So, so this is a very commonly used uh, technique that I highly recommend where you sort of take your business and try to map it to these nine uh, different areas and you define your business. So on one page, you are able to see where is the money coming from? Who's going to be, where do you spend your money? Where are the costs coming in? What are the key resources? Who are your key partners? Who are the key um, activities that you need to do? How do you manage all this stuff? So this is a nice one pager of how you define your entire business on one page. So this has become super popular and there are examples of this online of LinkedIn and other things. And I don't want necessarily want to go into this. And there is another set of things that people talk a lot about is how design thinking plus lean startup and agile, all of these are coming together. But if you really think about it, it's all about the same thing is how do I identify the problem? So some of the design th thinking techniques can be very useful in trying to identify it. And then you design the experiment, you try to learn across it, pivot, and then keep doing the same thing again and again. So this is really how businesses are built. And again, just to summarize what I'm saying is you cannot build a business in isolation. You have to ask the customers what you're doing as is making sense or not. And if you are able to get it all together, then that's where the business happens. Uh, I'm going to take a short pause here and see if this relates. And I'm going to change a little bit and give you another technique that is very commonly used. And uh, I love it because it's, uh, it's really simple, but it's very nice. And this has come from none other than Clayton Christensen, who is a 
who's I'm a big fan of his work. He has done some amazing work in terms of how to look at innovation and innovators dilemma and uh, a whole bunch of things. He's also a, he's no more, but he used to be a he has some great amazing stories online. So I'd be I would encourage you to look at some of the work that Jaden Christensen has done. Um, yes, Abai, you are trying to say something. Analyze some questions. We are trying to do that, but you can continue on. Okay, uh, sir, we are okay. Oh, okay, okay. All right. So let me uh, let me give you a very interesting technique that uh, Christensen uh, sort of championed. It was it is called the JTBD. It's called jobs to be done. Okay. So when you are building a business and you are trying to solve a problem. Typically, uh, when somebody is buying a solution or buying a product, they hire that product to do a service or a job that they need to get done. So, you know, when I'm using this camera, I'm trying to use this to solve a particular problem that is, needs to be done. And how do you go find it? So he talks about observe, focus, and a process, okay? So I'm gonna give you the example that is from their book or rather their article as well about how they decided to, you know, define a particular product and this is a project they did for a restaurant, let's say McDonald's, on the milkshake part of the product. So the question that they got as a consultant team was, why do people buy milkshake? And what are they really doing with the milkshake? Why is it that they, they buy milkshakes? And what this team did was they spent, um, you know, normally what you do is to go to restaurants, sit and see, observe when are people buying milkshakes? Why are they buying milkshakes? Are they buying it alone? Do they come with the family when they buy a milkshake, are they buying other food items and then buying milkshake and all of that stuff. And it just found out that, you know, most of the people ended up buying milkshakes at eight in the morning on their way to work. People came in alone, they were dressed for work, they were driving, they came in through the drive through or otherwise, bought a milkshake and then went on to drive. And later on, when they looked at it, they found that what is the job that they were hiring the milkshake to do? Now, they observed that most of the people who were buying this milkshake were buying this milkshake because they were on a commute 20, 25 minutes, half an hour. Uh, they had rushed to this commute, so they didn't have enough time to have breakfast. And they were looking for something that would keep them busy for the 20 minutes and felt good, you know, all of that stuff. And milkshake really addressed that particular job that they needed somebody to help them during this whole process. And um, the example was, okay, fine. If they didn't buy milkshake, what else would they do? So sometimes people tried a banana that worked for a period, but it finished very quickly. And what do you do with the skin? You have to throw it somewhere. When you're doing something like a bagel, then all this crust falls on your clothes. It feels really not so good. When you're buying Snickers, it again finishes very quickly and you feel like you have done a lot of sugar. So, you know, milkshake has this nice property. You can consume it very slowly. It sits in a cup uh, inside the thing. You can check it at the end of it and you have a nice 20 minutes of good feeling of drinking a milkshake while you are while you are traveling, right? So again, very nice example of how milkshake was trying to solve the job. So if you are able to identify the desires that an individual has, the limitations of current processes, what are the likely custom solutions and catalysts and other things, then magic happens and this is really what jobs to be done is all about. And then at that point, when you are able to meet your product meets the requirements of the job to get done, then people get into this nice cycle of saying that, you know, what am I using instead of that? Can I reconsider it? Can I buy something different? So you have an existing solution that is there and you bring in a new solution that you want to do. You, you're, if you do this analysis using jobs to be done and you are able to find a way to say that, you know, I have a new product that is solving the problem better, quicker, faster or whatever, and I'm reducing uncertainty, I'm making it easier to work. I can make it a habit and you will get much better performance in some sense. So this is another technique that people use to say when in a certain situation, I want to do this so I can expect this outcome. So if you are able to articulate your problem in this kind of a form, then it gives you a good sense of what is the context in which you are trying to solve this problem? What is the motivation and what is the expected outcome? And this is a good way to do this. And I find this technique to be very, very effective. And that's why I thought I'd, I'd share this with you. And if you relate this, this also makes sense in a PhD problem as well, that you have a particular situation. And then, uh, you know, how do I want to motivate that problem and see the expected outcome? 
So this is just some techniques that I'm sharing with you. There are many techniques that startups and founders use. The literature is full of papers, books, and other things on this topic. But you know, I thought um, I thought I'd get you started by thinking about these two ideas. One around this whole lean startup, which is basically uh, go ask the customer, do these short cycles, try to figure out what you are trying to do, build experiments, measure the outcomes of those experiments, and then decide to pivot or preserve. And then repeat this thing and you know keep moving. Here again, something similar is what is being done. Sir, you want to say anything on this? Do you agree so far? Yeah, surely. See, one of the other things which we often see is uh, we get uh, you know a lot of ideas, and we want to implement them. You know that a lot of innovative people get ideas, but we never try to look at what is the customer's interest in that and who is going to be the person who is likely to use that product. And then we right. get stuck with that idea and, and then we fail in that whole process. So right. innovation is one part. And sometimes we often say that idea is uh, ahead of time, then also it fails. And idea is sometimes late and therefore it fails. And therefore right time and right juncture and taking customer into confidence. I think the market survey for that purpose. These are very important things for uh, the business to succeed. Exactly. And uh, you said it right. Uh, you have an idea, but you don't know if it's going to work. How do you know if it's going to work? So there is a technique to follow. Can we follow that technique to find out if that idea makes sense or not? Can you convert it into a jobs to be done model? And I say that, okay, why, why should somebody buy it? Is there some benefit that I'm getting? Am I reducing pain? Am I giving you some advantage? So these are all techniques that one can follow to get the benefit of doing this. One other important aspect of having uh, to follow some of these things, and when you have an idea to take it all the way to the to completion, uh, team building or having a team is super important to make this work, right? So I'm going to share a little bit about how to build a team, okay? Um, let me uh, sort of just take a short pause. Ria, are you there? You think this is okay so far? You have any comments? So Ria is a budding PhD student. So let me ask her if she wants to say anything. Looks good so far. It makes sense. Does it relate to what you do? I mean, yes. Uh, in terms of the iterative cycle, I really liked how um, that is something that I have to practice on a constant basis. And it's good to know that that skill will ultimately be useful, even if day-to-day -day projects don't work. So just for um, for the rest of the audience, Ria is our is our daughter, and she is a PhD student at uh, UC Irvine, and she works on synthetic biology. So I thought we'd get someone to critique it uh, from the context of the students, because we end up looking at it in one particular way. And I'm doing my own thing, like saying, okay, let me try this out once. I did it once with the ACM crowd. I'm asking customers to take a look at it and then we'll go measure it. And if it doesn't work, I will pivot and build the next version. Of it. So anyway, so the team is like the most critical aspect of what you're trying to do when you're building the mission for the team. And it's the big mission that attracts the team and the talent. And so giving you a business example, I'm gonna share with you a very interesting story from a book that you might like. Now, this is the most important one that people use a lot. So this was Kennedy in, uh, early 60s, 61, he said, we are going to land a moon, person on the moon by the end of the decade. Now that particular mission, right, that we are going to land a man on the moon before the end of the decade, nine years, really galvanized the whole world, definitely the whole of US, NASA, all of those things. So the number of discoveries, science, technology that all happened around the moon, man on the moon mission, was amazing and it was all driven by this whole thing that I am going to land something on the moon within before the end of the decade. So having a mission really attracts the best team. And I'm going to tell, tell you a little bit about this through this particular, through examples of this particular book that I really love. The name of the book is called Beyond the Summit. And I have another reference of it towards the end. And it's written by a guy called Todd Skinner. Okay, Todd Skinner is a mountaineering person, he, he does mountaineering. And this particular book, Beyond the Summit, is about his ascent or climbing on something called the Trungo Tower. And I'm going to give you a little bit of his story of how he built the team. And I love this story because this story actually really 
it gives a nice example of how teams get built and how you need to create that big mission and how that is what attracts people to come to do something meaning, meaningful. So this is what I'm going to share in the next few minutes. So let me, let me give you a little bit about what Trango Tower is. So the Trango Tower, okay, so Todd Skinner is a mountaineering person and he has this special thing that they do, which is free climbing. What, what that means is that they climb with their bare hands and they do not use equipment to climb. They just use equipment to support them from falling off these cliffs. But they use their bare fingers and they're like the rock climbing kind of guys who walk up the, the flat wall that you see. So this is very common in Yosemite and this gentleman is from Wyoming and he had done Yosemite several times. And he had this thing that he wanted to do the Trango Tower. Now Trango Tower is about 20,000 plus feet in the Karakoram mountain range, okay? And it's um, it's a flat face, okay? About five, 6,000 feet of straight up climb. And this whole trip for them took about 60 days, okay? So 60 days of serious climbing where you're sleeping on these things. And just to give you a sense here, if you look at this picture and maybe hard to see this and the way it is gonna come up on video, but it's on this mountain face, the humans are like five pixels or 10 pixels. It's so small. And uh, this is how amazingly flat and straight up this particular uh, thing is. Now you wanna climb this and you don't know how to climb it and all of that. So this book really defines and shares his experience of putting the team up, okay? So I'm not gonna read this for you, but basically he talks about how this team came up and uh, different people came in. Now, the reality is the largest, the tallest peak in North America is less than 14,000 feet. And most of those feet, those peaks are not necessarily that hard to climb, relatively speaking, okay? And um, this, you're starting at that point and you're going all the way to 20 plus. So none of these people had ever climbed this kind of a mountain. They had no idea about how to go about doing this stuff, except for, of course, they knew that they wanted to do it. They were super trained athletes. They understood how to do it, but they had not done it. So how did this team happen? And that is true with startups. So if I'm building a new company, I know that I want to build it, but I have never done it before. If I had done it before, then you know I wouldn't do it again, right? So a lot of times people are doing these companies for the first time. So what was very important when they built this team one is that all members of the team absolutely wanted to climb this thing. And he said he spoke to about three, 400 people. And most of them said, forget it. I'm not even bothering to come there. Why would I want to climb this mountain? It's fatal. It's, I'm maybe dead and I just don't want to bother to doing it. But there were some people who came in because they really wanted to climb the mountain. So it is very important to bring in members on their team who are all passionate and excited about climbing this mountain. So that's the first thing. They all had a united, uh, unite, unified sense of mission. So they all wanted to go about and do this together. Every person on the team contributed to the success of the, the mountain. And each one of them was important. So you don't want to bring three people, four people on a team uh, in your, when you're starting out your startup who all do the same kind of thing. So if you're building like a team, think like a cricket team, right? So if you're building a cricket team, you need a wicket keeper, you need five bowlers, you need five batsmen. So you don't build a team uh, to say, okay, I'm going to play cricket with only batsmen on that team or only bowlers on that team. So you have to have a balanced team. You have to bring in everyone. Each one of the members needs to feel like they're contributing something and each one's role is important and you need to make that team that is sort of intense. They're all aligned to the mission and they all figure out how to go about it. So one of the examples of th things that he shares in this book, and I'm just blindly quoting some of the quotes from this book, because I so much love them. So he says, the mountain doesn't give a damn about your resume. Without hunger, both skill and experience will remain in the base camp. There is nothing more dangerous than a moderate mountain. Only the ultimate mountain will fold a forge an ultimate team. Your only guidebook to the mountain is the one you write. The best plan is the one that works, okay? So all of this stuff is beautifully described in this book. And he talks about mountaineering. He's not talking about business but 100% of this matches to the business. And you can see this in life as well. So when you have a cricket match and you have a cricket score of let's say 130 runs in a T20 match, those matches tend to become challenging because the, the, the thing is not, you know, you don't have that ultimate challenge. So people are trying to goof off, they don't be very serious about it. However, when you have to score 200, everyone tries to go, go after it, right? 
So there's a whole uh, attitude that gets created. So when you're building a business or you're trying to go after a mission, create that mission, create that inspiring mission that gets people yes. to say, yes, I want to do it. And that is what really drives people to get to success and not the fact that, you know, you know, oh yeah, come, let's all do it together. That doesn't help anybody. So if you want to get the best out of the team, you need an ultimate problem. You need an ultimate mission. And when you get the best people together and you build a team that has all aligned to each other and all of you are very focused to get to where you need to get to, that is sort of when success happens. So how you think is more important than what you know, and you need to bring teammates who will all be there and who, who are there for what they will do, not what they have already done. So this is another problem that we see in businesses a lot. Uh, we tend to hire someone on the basis of their resume and what they have done in the past not in terms of the attitude of where they are trying to go in the future. So when you are building a startup, you really want to do this. Now, let me sort of differentiate one thing that I'm sure some of you are thinking when you say, oh, resume, you know, it doesn't matter now. What I'm talking about here is the founders of the company. Once you have the founders of the company, you need the grants to do the work. Yes, resume matters for them because, you know, you want people who know how to do it and you don't want to train them. But uh, when you are trying to build a business to start with, you want to bring in the team they are the leaders in your team. So they need to be brought in because they believe in the mission, they have the right attitude and they're gonna go after it. Let me take a short pause here and see, you know, if this relates to what you see, sir, in your life and in your work that you do at AICT. Do you tend to agree with this? And how do you, how do you relate to this mountaineering business? No, the mountaineering business is absolutely invigorating. Actually, all the statements which uh, Todd had made, uh, they, they fit uh, any organization for that matter, whether it is uh, business, whether it is government, whether it is a regulating body like ours, or for that matter, even normal routine mundane work at family level. I, I think uh, that passion is so important. And, and unless you have that vision and passion and perseverance, no success can be achieved. Exactly. So one of the important things that you just said, right? So if you want to really solve some big problem, you want to take your team along, you want to galvanize the thing, creating a mission is a very important part of getting this to happen. So once you say, I want to get, like Bill Gates said it, I want to make sure that I have a, you know, a desktop and a um, computer on every desktop. That was a mission. If you look at some of the readings, and I've been reading a lot about what Jeff Bezos has been doing at Amazon, Pretty amazing stuff and how he thought of his, of his mission and how he went about doing it. So, so if you look at every successful team, every successful mission, you look at India's World Cup mission for 2011 when we won it with Dhoni, for three, four years, they were thinking about, that is my mission. I want to win the World Cup and that's all I care about. Right? So everybody was galvanized towards that effect. There was no disagreement, no dispute, and everyone was fully focused on getting to that job done. So businesses work well. If you are doing a startup, be very clear about the mission. It's the mission that will bring people together. Bring teammates for what they will do for you, not necessarily what they have done for the past. And really, this is uh, what makes a business successful. Yeah, I, I, and then I just would like to add here is that when we are uh, we uh, when we are actually uh, promoting students or pushing students to build prototypes on their ideas through our IIC initiative. Indian Institutional Council Initiative, where we are trying to ask students to go out, identify a problem, and build uh, prototypes or products to solve those problems. While building the teams for those prototype development, we are actually promoting students that just don't get somebody into your team because he's your friend or he's your neighbor or he's your uh, partner, you know, uh, boyfriend or a girlfriend. But actually, you should do something like a contest there also, where you know that what the person is bringing to the table. And you should create that kind of a team, even to build a prototype within your college. And if that team actually gels well and creates that product, then you can eventually, it's easy to convert it into a start. Uh, and, and some of these lessons that I'm sharing with you about, you know, this whole thing about iterative processes, building a team, how to manage cash. These are uh, useful things, even if you choose not to be an entrepreneur or not run your own business or anything else. In daily life and family life, as Sir mentioned, 
uh, it is important to bring everyone together to solve this great problem. Right now, we are in the midst of Corona. Clearly, COVID-19 is a big problem. It's our mission to go solve this problem. We have to find a way to solve this issue. That's how vaccines happened in nine months, because there was a mission to go after it. Right now, we are having oxygen shortage. Within a week, I'm sure there'll be enough new ideas that will come in that will solve this problem. So it is that big mission that drives, uh, motivates us to go solve it. And it's the leadership's responsibility to create that mission in that form that attracts the right people to come and we are all motivated and excited to get things to happen. There's a lot of difference between, you know, just doing things and doing it with this intensity and, uh, you know, uh, excitement because you're trying to achieve something that is going to solve world hunger, solve great problems, solve climate change. So creating that mission is critical and important. And I highly encourage you to try it even in your day-to-day -day projects that you may be looking at. Uh, I want to keep moving to the next part of this thing and then we'll take questions towards the end again. And this is related to cash generation. I'm going to share uh, some of the work from two of my favorite uh, authors in some sense. One is this book that I really love and I've given out several hundred copies of this to people. It's called What the CEO Wants You to Know. It's by Ram Charan. And Ram Charan is, again, a beautiful author. I love the work he does. And I'm going to share a little bit from his book and a little bit from Ashok Korwar's book. And Ashok is a um, collaborator I work with, and he has this beautiful book called Finance at Work, What the CFO Doesn't Want You to Know. So there are slightly different contrasting ways of how that he does it. Now, um, when you look at uh, some of the work that Ram Charan done, has done, Ram Charan, of course, is US-based. He's been an advisor to some of the largest companies, including General Electric and several others. He has taught at Harvard and various other places. So he's a very celebrated uh, professor, academic, and uh, advisor. But this particular book, he talks about his upbringing and growing up in a family that was in the business of shoes in Agra. Okay, so a lot of his examples are things from there. And his basic point is when you look at any business and you're looking at a business out of it, there are four things that are very critical in a business. The first thing is, are you satisfying the needs of your of the customer better than the competition? So if you are not solving the problem better than your competition, then somebody else will go to the competition. So when you are analyzing a business, you have to identify and look at, is the, is the customer's needs being solved better than the competitors? Is this product really, or is this business um, better at solving customers' needs than the competition? The second thing is, is this business generating cash? And I'm gonna to explain to you a little bit about how cash generation is calculated, but this is very important that you need to make sure that you have more money and you're de delivering decent returns on your invested capital, and there is long-term growth in what you're trying to do. So when you're measuring your business, you're trying to make sure that it's growing well, it is delivering return on the invested capital, it's generating cash, and then you are solving a problem that you are solving better than in your customers, um, for your customers better than any other competitor. So if you have to ask this question, what is the purpose? If you were to go out of business, would somebody be affected? The answer should be yes, some customers would, would miss you because you're providing value to them. Okay, so that's really what it is all about. So as I said, you know, the core idea of a business is, are you able to attract customers against your competitors? And are customers like, or they use find your products very useful. That's really what it is. Now, there are certain metrics that are very important and I'm gonna sort of attempt to share with you a little bit of accounts 101 in some sense in very simple terms. And this is very useful for any business that you're looking at. So one of the most important terms that you should understand is gross margin. So what does gross margin mean? Gross margin means if you earn a certain amount of money, Let's say you are selling shoes as Ram Charan talks about in his book. And uh, let's say you sell a shoe at uh, 500 rupees um, a pair and you sell thousand shoes, so you're collecting five lakh rupees. But you bought these shoes at 300 rupees a pair. So the cost of goods supplied, uh, cost of goods sold, COGS as they call it was about three lakh rupees. So you made two lakh rupees profit on a five lakh rupee business. So the total revenue was 5 lakhs. You made a profit of revenue minus cost of goods sold, and your gross margin was 40%. This is an important number to know. So what is your gross margin is the amount you earn, your revenue minus the cost of goods sold divided by the revenue. Now, this is a very simple metric and it's used for all kinds of things. So when I'm comparing two products, so let's say I make shoes and chappal. 
Should I make more shoes or should I make more fur? The question depends on what the gross margin of your shoe is versus the gross margin of chappals. So you can compare different things on it. So should I sell to this customer group or that customer group? Should I sell my product to young children or should I sell it to adults, right? Depends on what the gross margin may be on different kinds of things. Should I sell my books online or should I sell them through the stores? Again, gross margin is a good question to identify on this. So, you know, a lot of these kinds of things you use for comparison. So I'm comparing this versus this. So I have two numbers, I have two gross margins. I choose which one is better depending on the gross margin that I'm looking at. Another very important item is to look at return on investment. So the idea is that if I spent creating a business with certain amount of money, what is the monthly income or monthly return that I'm getting on? Now you can measure this against different kinds of things. You can measure it against capital invested, in which case you have return on capital invested. You can return on equity. So shareholders put some money in the business and then over a year, you start getting returns on it. So what is the return on equity? Return on assets could be another one. So you buy a house, you don't rent it, it's sitting there, you have no return on your asset. Let's say you buy a machine, it's being used for building other machines out of it or you are using it for, you know, so you buy a coffee machine and you're generating coffee out of it every time. So that income that you're getting out of it is coming out of these assets. So clearly return on assets becomes another very important uh, item. Um, this is the most important item that I think most people miss out. People get too stuck into P&Ls and all of that stuff. The reality of the business is to generate cash. What does cash generation mean? It's very simple. Uh, you're, you are collecting money, you are spending money every day. At the end of it, what is left is cash generation. And I want to share a very interesting story again. I'm going to give you the story without necessarily reading this. So this is a story that Ram Charan describes in his book. And this is from, he said he took a bunch of students to Nicaragua for a visit to a street fair. So they were looking at all of these things and they were looking at some dresses and some MBA student asked this lady who was selling some dresses saying, you know, where do you get your money? Where do you borrow it? So she says that she borrows it at two and a half percent interest every month. So it's two and a half percent interest. That's almost 30% a year. So no, no, not 30, it's 34% because you have compound interest, right? So every month you're borrowing at two and a half percent. So says, okay, if you're borrowing at 34% a year, how do you still make money out of all of this stuff, right? So the point is terms. What she says is, is about the velocity. So I buy something, um, I buy some clothes at two and a half percent interest. I sell it at a higher price. I make the turn on that cash. I return that money and then Yes, I had to pay interest if I held that money, but since I am churning cash on an everyday basis, I don't need to hold that money for too long. So a little amount of money is useful for my running of the whole business. So if I give you another example, so let's say I'm selling shoes like uh, Ram Charan's family was doing and I'm in this business of shoe shoes. Now, if you look at it at the end of the year, you might say that, okay, I was, uh, you know, I bought, let's say uh, 10 lakh rupees worth of shoes. Now, the problem is that if I sold shoes every day, I was buying every day and selling every day, I was not locking that money up for the whole year. And hence, even though it would have cost me 34%, that 34% is for only that period of time that I'm locking the money. So if I'm able to roll my cash every day, I can get much better business and returns. Anybody who runs a restaurant completely understand the, uh, understands the turns business, which means that if I have a table on the in my restaurant, that is really what decides uh, how much money I'm going to make if I'm able to turn the same table many times, meaning I can serve idli vada every 15 minutes to people who keep sitting on that table, then I'm able to make a lot more money. If I have to keep that person there for a long time, then I make a lot less money. So you'll find that profit margins in businesses that are able to do multiple turns can be much lower. They are able to manage costs much better because you are able to roll your money much faster. So these are all techniques that people understand and this is what it, it all means is called velocity or turns. So really it's basically how many times can you roll your money multiple times, like the more number of times you can roll your, your money, the faster the velocity, the higher the return. So you know when you're running a small business or any business for that matter, uh, it's not enough to just look at the profit and loss statement. It is important to look at cash flows, look at the cash generation that you are making, what is the return on cash that you have? How long are you holding your cash? 
for getting that money to happen? And how many turns can you run off that same cash? So if I borrow 100 rupees and I'm able to go to the store, buy some vegetables, make 120 out of it. Now my 100 is back to buy another 100 rupees of stuff. Now I can do 120 rupees of more food and things I can buy in there. Tomorrow I make a little bit more money. So if I'm not holding cash for too long and I'm able to rotate it much faster, then you get much better business. And that's what this is all about. Term. And the fact is, if you run out of cash, you are bankrupt. So cash generation matters much more than profit. People tend to get too stuck on profit. Profit is important, but you know it is cash generation that determines how you will see your business survive. So what happens is that typically these are the examples of things that I shared with you. One is sales, gross margin, net profit, velocity, return on investment, invested capital, cash generation, market share. These are used for comparison. So I can compare between one business and another business and third business, and you can see which one is better. Now, clearly, I'm going to yeah, people spend three years doing a BCom degree. They spend a lot of time looking at all of these numbers and chartered accountants have very detailed things. So what I'm giving you here in a 10 minute thing is not a substitute for that course, but I'm trying to tell you how important it is and how some of these concepts are relatively simple. If you're running a business, understand how you're going to turn the business. How often is the cash going to happen? Are you going to make money or not? Or what is the gross margin of your business? And really, how does it work? So let me take a short pause and see um, if this makes sense uh, thing. And I'm going to have very few slides now to finish. And uh, in another five to 10 minutes, we will be done. So, um, uh, Anil, sir, do you have, do you think this is, you have so Anand, you would you like to anything comment? further? So, Anand, would you, uh, uh, so Anand, would you like to comment on the current business models, which many of these startups are following of uh, valuation more means they are actually pumping huge amount of money, which hardly any revenue and they don't see profit, uh, they may not see profit in the next 20 years, 30 years. So those kind of business models, which are now getting highly promoted, would you like to comment on it? Um, yeah, see, uh, it, it has two, three things here. So let's look at Amazon, for example, which supposedly has not been making profit, but they have been generating cash. So, you know, it is not fair to say, okay, they are not profitable, but they are cash generating machines. Every month they make cash. Now, clearly investors like machine businesses that turn cash very often. A lot of the trading businesses tend to do well because they are into the cash generation machines and your investments are limited. Now, if you're looking at some of these kinds of things, people are looking for return on invested capital. So a lot of these businesses where people are investing a lot of money up front to, to sort of eventually get long-term returns, these investors are looking for uh, ways of how to make money on it in the future. So in respect of getting into the business model concept, let me share a couple of things relating to VC investments and people looking at venture capital as a way to get your business to happen. I'm gonna give you a few very simple rules. One is please understand that someone who is giving you money, um, when they are giving you money as a venture capitalist, they are giving you money because they are expecting return from it and significant amount of return from it. So unless you are able to showcase to your partners or your business associates or people who are investing money, how they will see return on your money, they will not be investing in your business. So if you want to make a business and you want to go raise money, show returns to the investor as an important aspect of what you need to do before anybody will invest money in your business. So that's the first and most important thing that I can say. The second thing I want to tell you is that, you know, most of the VCs typically want to invest in the equity in your business. Now, equity is really valuable and you should use this equity for growth of your business, meaning raise money from venture capitalists when you have made your experiments and you have figured out exactly what you need to do and you're looking for scaling your business. Don't borrow money on as equity for experimenting, trying out things and failing because that's very expensive money. So those will be the two guiding principles that I would suggest about trying to go to VCs. One is when you go to a VC, think of their returns, right? So unless they see returns, they're not going to invest in your business. So don't show them a business model that shows, uh, you know, con continuous growth and them invested in that business forever. People are looking to say that if I give you hundred rupees within five years, you're going to give me 500, but not only are you going to give me 500, I have the ability to take that 500 back from you out of your business by either you sell your business or you have way of returning that cash back to me. So I'm not interested in investing in a business 
that doesn't return that cash back to me. So that's something very important. And second thing, as I mentioned to you, you need to think about, uh, you know, making sure that you use the business money because it's expensive and it's, it's used for scaling your business rather than for experimenting on somebody else's money. And um, yeah, meaning uh, if you can get, if your business has the ability to, you know, say that if, if you spend a billion dollars, you'll make $10 billion and you're able to make a convincing case, then yes, people will invest in that. So for example, if there's a lot of discussion about this cred and their business model, but you know, clearly the investors believe that if they are able to quote unquote, have access to a large number of uh, very rich people who are paying credit card bills using credit, that is valuable and they can monetize that for the future. So it all depends on what your context is. Yeah, currently for credit, I think uh, they are spending 172 rupees per one rupee they are earning, you know, that's what at least the data is showing. Yeah, whatever it is, but the fact is that they have people. Uh, so whatever that may be, the point is that there are investors who believe that that investment is eventually going to get returns for them. And that's the reason why they're giving the money. So it's, you know, every business has their own uh, ways of how they do it. I don't, I think it's fine if they are, if you're able to raise that kind of money, you can create that kind of business model. But if you don't have that kind of money, don't run a business model of this kind. So, you know, a lot depends on your context in which you are looking at. So I want to finish this with one very simple, but very nice set of uh, Purva's doctrines, as I call, as he has written for them. And he's basically, some of these are very relevant in my opinion to even PhD students. So for example, um, you know, when you're looking at money and all of that stuff, the first point that he makes is about sunk cost, which means that if you have already spent some time and energy doing it, instead of trying to worry about how to salvage everything, then and think about the future and see how it might be there. Money has time value. This is very important because, you know, um, if you are able to spend money to save time, it's worth it. If you're spending time, you have to look at time and money as value for each other. And sometimes uh, it's better to spend the money than spend time. In some cases, better to spend time than to spend money. But you have to look at time as an important aspect of your money thing as well. And um, you know, one other thing that I like here is you cannot make money on something that everybody knows. Uh, you'll make money when other people are not on it. If everybody is in it, then the value comes down. So you have to find those unique problems. You have to find those unique solutions where, um, you know, you need to go. And uh, that's really what it is. And um, you need to find a way to grow the cake rather than slice the cake is sort of another idea that you mentioned. And I want to finally uh, sort of mention this particular concept of a sunk cost. Sunk cost is a cost that has already occurred and cannot be recovered by any means. And this is one of those things where I see a lot of people making bad decisions because of some cost. So I'll give you an example. So someone who has spent say two years in uh, going to a medical school and then realizes that's not really what they want to do, but oh, I've spent two years, let me try to finish it. So I'm gonna spend another four years trying to finish my degree because I already spent two years. This is some cost. And the question you have to ask is that, all right, I've spent two years, fine, this cost is gone. If I'm not gonna benefit from my next four years, my dropping off now is better than dropping off after six years. So these are kinds of decisions that we make all the time in our lives where sunk cost is something we don't think about. And this is something that we should be very careful about and say that, you know, I should know what I have spent and I should look at what more do I need to spend when I look at the future of that value rather than look at only the past of the value. Just because I've done something doesn't mean I need to continue to do it. I need to think about it in terms of where it needs to go. And I want to tell you this for those of you who are doing a PhD, your PhD is a sunk cost, it's done. Great, you got the benefit out of it. Just because you did a PhD in a certain area or a certain problem doesn't mean you need to continue to work on that same problem for the rest of your life. It's a journey. So you have learned how to go about it, having completed your PhD or have you decided where you are. At that point, you need to decide what, need, what you need to do in the future and your success depends on what you do from here on rather than worrying too much about what you have done so far. And this is true in life as well. And all of you should think about this. And this is sort of my last slide. And I'm going to go to this ask me anything kind of a discussion mode here. Let me take a short pause. Let me see if any of the people on the panel have any comments on any, anything that I've shared and if they would like me to elaborate or highlight anything that they think I should have, I should explain again. So let me ask uh, Anilji if he has anything you'd like to ask or 
some of the other panelists that we have, if they have any questions for us, and then we, of course, take questions from the field as well. Uh, Anand, I still don't understand uh, how the startups which are emerging today, a lot of investments are happening from VCs, and I don't see the uh, uh, light at the end of the tunnel. You know, years after years, you know, they are in negative, and still there are investments coming in. So, what is that scope that uh, VCs are looking at? That maybe five years down the line, ten years down the line, it's going to make profit and money. Uh, this is one uh, thing which I is always intriguing me. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know what is the psychology of VCs, uh, but some of these very talented uh, young startups they don't get money, and where are there are others names are big and they keep getting a lot of money from VCs. This is one problem which <laughs> I often don't understand. The second is about the gross margin which you talked about. Uh, gross margin certainly should be higher, no doubt about it. But many times because of either legal compulsions or even from the societal impact point of view, uh, maybe even if the gross margin is less, I think that may be important actually in some times, you know, from the right. angle maybe social entrepreneurship. So, so even if the gross margin is less, probably in the, uh, it's a long term, probably you are serving the society. So we should not be too much worried about gross margin all, all the time. As long as margin exists, you know, it doesn't matter. No, no. So let me, no, no. So let me explain a little bit here. Uh, so I never said that you need to have high gross margin. What I'm trying to say is that you need to have gross margin to compare with other business. So when I'm comparing one business with the other business, that's when gross margin okay. becomes relevant. So if I'm comparing one social business that generates 3% gross margin versus another social business that generates 5% gross margin, uh, or I have some parts of my thing that look at it this way or that, it is used for comparison. So this is an easy way of comparing two businesses, and that's what it is. At the end of it, the gross margin is whatever you think is appropriate for your business, and could be small. And one of the examples that I shared with you is when you have high number of turns on the business, with lower gross margin, you will still be able to make decent amount of money, or you will see a lot more profits in the whole thing, and you will run a much more better business in some sense, because you have lots of turns coming. in. So small profit of over a large volume is sometimes what helps people to show that. And this is one of the key things also when you look at businesses that supposedly are not making profit, you have to also look at cash generation that they are doing. So some of these businesses are generating cash on an ongoing basis, or they're collecting assets of value that, that then can be monetized. Some of the investors believe that that's a good place to invest. And after all, you know, you're looking for something unique and different. And if I'm able to get to that number of people, then that has value and potentially they could get acquired at a higher price. So that's what uh, investors are sometimes gambling on. But, uh, you know, everyone has to choose what is right for them. So the so, best example, so the you, best you, example is of YouTube. When they bought YouTube, I think it was one point, when Google bought YouTube, it was 1.03 billion or something. Now that, that much of revenue they are generating every week nowadays. But now, it has started happening now, after 10, 12 years. So, uh, uh, sometimes, uh, investors, sometimes investors do have uh, that patience. <laughs> Unfortunately, that, that patience is not there in the uh, biotech industry or pharmaceutical industry, where the investment cycles are pretty large and, uh, you know, uh, where the product development takes maybe 8 to 10 years. So, that's where they have investor community is not very patient. You know, that's the, another problem. Uh, anyway, uh, sir. Uh, Anand, I, I, in a lighter way, because this is all for uh, PhD students, I'm comparing uh, our uh, uh, this gross margin in terms of number of research papers being produced, you know, so between the guide and students. So many times there can be a very high impact factor, single paper, but uh, in another area, you keep on publishing even 10 papers not having the same value. So gross margin, we can look at it from the research perspective as well. Sure. Um, it's a good point, sir. Um, yeah. Yes, sir. Do you have any comment to make? Hello. Yeah, Hello. we can hear you. We can ah. hear you. Uh, Namaskar, this Pandey Sahib, it was wonderful. In fact, I think some, some 6,000, 7,000, uh, you are saying, um, uh, students were connected in this program. It's amazing, sir. We have enjoyed a lot, in fact. And in Indiana State, you studied, sir, MTech PhD, you are done. And I'm fortunate enough 
I have also stayed there for 10 days in one leadership program. It's an amazing place. It is, it is wonderful, wonderful, sir. Uh, when we were deciding this ARIA ranking, I discussed with, with uh, Abe that how our MTech and PhD thesis can be converted into some useful product and finally some, some revenue generation. And on the basis of that one, institute should be ranked. And in fact, that foremost parameter we have added into our ARIA ranking. Yes, Our yes. PhD thesis will be useful only if some useful, useful outcome is coming and that too in the form of some, some development of society, the, the, the sustainable development concept means in terms of revenue, in terms of environment, in terms of our money in the society like this one. So that, that we are implemented also uh, when we are comparing US, Germany, UK and India. That is, first of all, in terms of PhD programs, if you are or PhD students who are coming out every year, if I'm comparing. From US, around 70,000 students are doing PhD. In Germany, it is 28,000, UK, 25,000. Ours is, again, around 25,000. But all, not in engineering, all sort of education which you are providing, out of that one, 25,000 PhD thesis are coming. But in engineering and technology, as Honorable Chairman sir said, that around 6% students are pursuing MTech out of that total 1 uh, million students are pursuing BTech programs. But UG to PhD ratio in, in our engineering education, if you see, sir, it is only 0.25. So every year in engineering and technology, 2,500 students are doing PhD. First of all, so that number is very, very small, in fact. And we have never been taught, particularly when we studied, when we are done our MTech and PhD, never it has been told that for what purpose you are doing MTech and PhD and how this work can be converted into some useful product or some useful business. Even we were not knowing, in fact, MTech we have done because we wanted promotion, PhD we have done because we wanted to become professor. My guide was guiding to me because he wanted again promotion, some research publication like this one. So we never came out from, from um, this sort of jugglery that why this thing is being done. So first of all, I'll congratulating uh, this one is you and Abe specifically, first of all, uh, providing him space to, to be connected with the AICT and creating whole sort of environment in whole country now. Now every student, even BTEC students, they are coming with some idea. The idea may not be very important, but at least their mindset, it has been changed. It is not just like inside class teaching, which was happening for 30 hours in a week, and there was an end term examination, finally we were given degree. Now students are thinking that not only class time is important, inside the class is important, they are saying even outside class time, which is available, that is also very, very important. There they are learning this team building ability, the, the new ideas are getting generated. And every year, uh, with the effort of Abhay Jere and his team, I think around some 4,000 new ideas are coming. So out of that one, we are able to select some 100 ideas who are getting some, some useful products and getting revenue generation. But remaining 3,900 ideas are not bad. Actually, we are having capacity, AICT is having capacity to, to impart some financial help to some 100 students. And that's why we are having a method of elimination, that we are eliminating, 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 and we are selecting some 100. But if all sort of resources are available, then even those 4,000 ideas also can be used, in fact. And even we can motivate those students at least to go with those ideas in their MTech program. Or if they are pursuing their MTech, then they can go with their, those ideas with PhD program. And certainly, if those sorts of students are entering into this research, probably their, their outcome will be very, very serious. Abhay, you are, you are giving some input on this one? Yeah, so basically, sir, uh, uh, as you rightly said, uh, when we are doing our ARIA now ranking mechanism, uh, that ranking framework has a huge component on uh, revenue generation, startup creation, patents which are getting commercialized, and so on and so forth. So we have about eight, ten parameters which are there, which are looking, uh, which are looking at converting research into you know a product or an enterprise which actually results in revenue generation. And when we started this ARIA ranking, none of the institutes, even IIT and IISC had that kind of a data. Now for the last two or three years, now they have started collecting that data that how many of their PhD theses or MTech theses are actually getting converted into uh, startups. 
and uh, incubating them. And they are actually tracking now the revenue generation uh, done by the startups or funding uh, actually uh, raised by the startup. And we are getting all that data. For the first time in this country, this is happening. Another thing, as Anand was also pointing it out, uh, through IIC initiatives, we are doing large number of awareness, such awareness program. And this is also one of the uh, awareness program, which is part of our IIC activity. And my IIC team actually ensured that majority of the institutions do connect to this uh, talk because we are very keen on pushing our students not to just focus on academics, getting into this rote learning, swallow and vomit kind of an education, but more into creativity, more into uh, what we can say idea generations, which could be taken into, uh, which can be taken forward as enterprise, you know. So Saraswati and Lakshmi needs to now go together. So hmm. that is what we are telling all the youngsters that just don't focus on Saraswati, ex also explore how you can pursue Lakshmi simultaneously. And that's the reason we have few questions for Anand uh, from our uh, viewers, where viewers are keen on knowing whether Anand, when he started a persistent system, was thinking of converting into P his PhD work into uh, the company or persistent system was doing something very, started doing something very different than what he did as his PhD work. Um, so, regarding my PhD work, uh, my thesis was on nested relational databases and implementation of that. And uh, while persistent worked in the data related areas predominantly because I knew people in that area, the thesis was not necessarily the reason for the, the PhD. As I said, PhD was a PhD at the end of it that was done. I learned how to go about this process. I made lots of good friends and networked with people. And that was what was valuable when I set up persistent and we kind of benefited from that. And my ability to look at hard problems and come in with solutions was useful from that point of view. But of course, you cannot always use your PhD thesis for, for everything else. So see, again, you know, I want to point out a few things that are very relevant and somehow, you know, I think are important and people get missed out. Um, this whole life or anything that we do is all about trying things out, deciding which ones work, and then pivot and preserve. So not everything that was built has to go to something else. So my point is that, yes, there are maybe like 40,000 theses that happen. Not every thesis is worthwhile to be converted into a business or otherwise. So, you know, some have to work, some have not, but the process of how you got to that is the key part. And that process is something that you can repeat again with different kinds of context. So that's really what this is all about. And when I started processing, yes, my knowledge of PhD and my degree and everything else and the network I made was very valuable, but I was not trying to take my PhD thesis into a problem to make money out of it directly. So another very interesting your question. Yeah, yeah. So a related question uh, again, uh, that when you are doing your PhD, usually you are, you are doing academics and with that mindset, when you started uh, thinking about your own enterprise, huh? how that mindset change? Because that, that's a very different shift, you know, when you are shifting from academics to business, you know, how, what? Well, uh, so as I said, you know, what I was trying to explain to you in this whole early part as well was that they are not that different. And I was an enterprising PhD student. This is something my advisor will also tell you. So I was never... Uh, I don't see them being that different from each other. It's all about uh, being part of the network, trying out different things, experimenting, connecting, building on what is there and taking it further. So I, I don't see that mindset to be as different as people make it out to be. I think the PhD uh, degree and the what you learn in a PhD and how you approach your PhD is very entrepreneurial in its nature. And if you take your PhD to be a mission that you are trying to work on, you'll find that it's not very different from what a business is. So I don't believe that, you know, there's an academic mindset and a, an entrepreneurial mindset. Actually, the entrepreneurial mindset makes as much sense during the PhD as it makes after the PhD. Okay. So I think uh, we have large number of questions, but I think uh, we are already towards the end of the program because it's already 12.25. So, yes, I was coming to you. Yes, yes, yes. 
Yeah. I mean, uh, the, the major takeaway is know your customers, in fact. While we are yes. allotting the topic even to students, first of all, maybe PhD, MTech students, students should know that what exactly I'm doing and um, whatever I'm doing, who will be the beneficiaries, in fact, who will be taking benefit of this one, how I'll be helping the society. So when we are deciding the, the, the um, research guide, in fact, that research guide, first of all, should think that who will be the main researcher, then can we connect some innovator also with that researcher? Because that researcher may not become the innovator. There, there, is, there, there is possibility that one another student who is having an inclination towards innovation and may be coming through our this innovation um, um, ideas which students are coming. Can we connect these students with that research friend? And then some entrepreneur also. It is not necessary that innovator will become entrepreneur. That is also not necessary. You know, there may be separate third person. And finally, the talented guide. There has to be a team of four person. And if that four person team we are having, then fifth one which we need, then some, some successful entrepreneur with them. So that sort of team, it, if it can be created, and that sort of environment, if it can be created, I think success can be with the help of this one. Then away with, with MTech and PhD, now more time we should give. We are, we are concentrating on BTEC only. Majority of the ideas which we are having, majority of the competitions we are having, it is for BTEC students. If we can concentrate on our MTech and PhD also, there may be a lot of, lot of scope in that one. And finally, sir, whatever you have, you have important, uh, whatever you said, it is not important what anyone is knowing, important what they are able to do. In fact, it's foremost is case generation for any successful business. But one, one line I'm adding with this one, sir, with successful business, I'm adding that business should be socially responsible, in fact. And above all, big mission is, uh, most important is the sparkling leadership for that one. So if, if that sort of um, ladder, if we can create, then I think the, the, the majority of the, the ideas which we are having in our mind, we can have great success. Thank you, thank you very much, sir, for giving opportunity to all of us to, to listen to this. My pleasure. Uh, it was a real pleasure talking to you all. Uh, if you have further questions, of course, I've shared with you my Twitter handle. My LinkedIn is quite visible and also my email. Please send me mail. I'll be try my best to give you an answer if I can. Now I will request uh, Raju, uh, sir, to actually do a vote of thanks. Thank you, Abhay. Uh, first of all, I extend my sincere thanks from AICT to Anand Deshpandeji, who has spared his valuable time and give a keynote this address to our PhD, PhD and master's students, how they can enter in the venture of startups. So you beautifully explained the experiences of some of the most uh, renowned authors in that area and uh, shared the experiences of the successful and if we can add some unsuccessful stories in that venture also, that will further add. Uh, and uh, you shared all these uh, loop in which they can start their ventures in the direction we can think. But the ultimate uh, 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 quote is from the book, Beyond the Summit, that best plan is the plan that works. So uh, every theory, there are theories which are based on the experiences of the uh, entrepreneurs, those who have entered in this arena, but definitely the best plan is that that works. With all these words, once again, I th extend my sincere thanks to you, sir. We have great association with persistent system, not only from the organizational point of view, from your uh, foundation also, but on personal level also, my son, he was working in uh, Citrix and that uh, Citrix was acquired by persistent for some time he has also worked in persistent before the then he migrated to us for and presently is working in microsoft so thanks thanks for giving time to aict and in time to come we can expect that many more talks of similar type that can motivate to our students particularly masters and phd students so that they can convert their knowledge to wealth so as per national education policy, the ultimate aim is that 
our knowledge should not confined to our libraries it should convert to wealth with all these words thank you thank you very much namaskar thank you very much uh, thank you anand that was uh, let's yes. go off live